Degrassi, Degrassi, Degrassi. You say the word Degrassi and I think... So many words. Groundbreaking. Drama. Oh my gosh. Scandal. <gasps> Relatable. Stress. Exciting. Um, is it bad that I say Drake? It was amazing. Degrassi? Degrassi. Canada. My second high school. My whole childhood, really. We really grew up on the show together. Transformative. You can't even describe how amazing that was. Life-changing. It's way more than that. It's real, man. It's real. It's phenomenal what they've created. It was groundbreaking. Iconic. Real. They've obviously changed the face of television. I mean, look at the history of the Grassy. It's been around for so yeah. long, and the material that it's touched on, and the things that it's been able to do within you know the 14 years it's been on air is incredible. In the Grassy, what we try and do is tell an authentic teen experience. No topic is taboo. Always pushing the envelope, always testing the limits. And the show itself was encouraging people to talk about things in honest ways. Whoa, that show goes there. <laughs> Degrassi's pretty cool. Degrassi. What the hell did I ever do to you, Claire? You got me pregnant. I'm transgender. I just don't know if I can say bye to my daughter. I was drunk and helpless, and you assaulted me. I'm gay. I set the whole thing up. You stabbed me in the back. Put the gun down, okay? It's too late. Go! Oh. Welcome to Degrassi. I like it at Degrassi. I love this school. Degrassi has been part of my life for 35 years. Linda, as an executive producer, is just an incredibly inspiring woman. Prior to becoming a, a television producer, I actually spent eight years in the classroom teaching junior high level. A school teacher with a curiosity about film equipment. Linda had an idea. She followed a passion, built an international iconic brand from nothing. And she made it into this entire world. Welcome to Degrassi! Linda and Steven are an incredible team. My wife and I have been executive producers of the show. Degrassi is their baby. Lynn and Steven are mom and dad. The mother and father. Mom and pop. Yeah, mom and dad. <laughs> They've created this legacy. Yep. They believe in it so yep. deeply to the core. Yep. They're just so passionate about the show and really care about making a difference in the lives of kids. No matter what we did or where we went, I felt like we were in good hands. I know my lines. Well, maybe if you'd stop changing the blocking every five minutes, then... I know. How about I change the casting instead? I used to watch the show well before um, getting on it, and I thought I was the only one who knew about this show. It was a show I always, always wanted to be on. As an actor, you know, the Degrassi script comes across your desk. You know you're going to be a part of something big. The audition itself, I think it was just so nervous that I was shaking through the whole thing. OK, maybe I'm being a little melodramatic. I get this part, which was a delight, and the next day I have to shoot, and I get there and they're like, we need you to break dance. I, saw, I thought to myself, I don't know what I did in that audition that would imply superb break dancer. I think and it's nice too that the show casts age appropriate. Like I think that's very unique to this program. Actual teenagers playing actual teenagers. We're gonna be 16 this year. Miriam at the time was 13. Cassie, who played Manny, was supposed to be 12, but she was actually 11. She might have lied about her age. We were like 14, 15 years old. Hormones were raging. You see people grow up. You see people who start off at 13 years old, 14 years old, and then they graduate when they're 18, 19. When we get to uh, grade 12, they they move on. It's constantly changing. It's like a real high school. The actors themselves, of course, are moving on. And so those final scenes of graduation are incredibly emotional. There's a lot of tears, and a lot of them are coming from me. So I guess it's up to us to keep the drama going? But there's definitely some very dedicated and loyal fans.
I got so many lovely messages and I still get them to this day. We showed up in person at a mall in America and it was saw thousands of really people there with signs and t-shirts and crying. This one girl, she comes up to me and she was like, can I jump you? And I was like, uh, security? This little girl came up and she was shaking. I'd never seen someone so excited. She had her little chihuahua. She wanted me to sign the chihuahua. You can walk in a mall like years later and have people kind of come up and grab you and hug you. And you kind of just know why. Our storyline spoke to them, and I think that uh, it's very rare that television packs a punch like that. I think that when fans watch an episode, they're feeling like, I got really close to making that mistake. Or they see something in themselves, and they find themselves going, that's why I'm hurting so badly. Every season, we have fans write to us and just tell us how like one story has impacted their lives. Wow. I've been off the show for three years, and I still get girls being like, Fiona's storyline gave me courage to come out to my friends and family. You think, yeah, this is why we all do what we do. And it was so cool that we got to touch these kids' hearts and just teach them all these issues that are going on. It's always portrayed really serious issues that a lot of teens are going through, and it doesn't try to glorify it. It's not like a public service announcement. Like, it just kind of shows these things that are happening. the most itchiest, horribly embarrassing, <laughs> uncomfortable moment of my life. You're on a compound together all the time, like a camp? Yeah. We were camp. like at camp, an we're old boys camp. camp. Marco loved that. All the coming out stories are different and are really true to their eras. Obviously, diversity is really important to Degrassi, and one of the reasons why Adam came onto the show was we really wanted to tell the story of the transgender journey, and that's something that we hadn't done before. Adam is a female to male transgender. The Adam storyline was important for the same reason why it's important to me, is I had zero idea about that topic. I wanted to portray him to the best, and you know, obviously the binding of the boobs was something that was kind of painful. Learned so much about the trans experience through the character Adam. So many different aspects, the different pressures, and how that's unique to the trans experience. That's a pretty demanding role. She had to cut her hair short for a long period of time. My favorite memory of Claire is when she so wholeheartedly accepted Adam, because Claire could have gone either way. I'm an FTM, female to male transgender. Does that mean you're gay? No, I, I like girls. Cool. He was kind of like, yes, and? Who cares? He's like, you're who you are. I know you for this, and you're a great person. You're funny, you're creative, you're smart. Like, who cares about anything like that? So I think their relationship was awesome because he defended him. He is with Bianca, kind of starting a little bit of a love interest, and then just as he's gaining confidence, she finds out that he is a transgender, and it, it just kind of freaked Bianca out. Well, what's going on there? <laughs> Nothing. You're too skinny to have man boobs. Stop! That was the exposure for him. And he must have been so embarrassed at that time and so open. That's like the worst nightmare for somebody that's trying to hide that. I mean, they don't want everybody in the school knowing. Did you miss the sign on the door? No, I saw it, thanks. It means guys. And uh, we heard something from B. He was struggling with becoming himself. And Adam was bullied by people in school who didn't understand his situation. The help of some awesome friends and family and people that will accept, he became the awesome guy that he is. And I'd love to have him as a friend. Not ready to burn it? Still me. Adam, who was finally getting into a good place. Adam is camping with some of his friends, and he's like, I need to see Becky right now. I need to go. We were sitting in the read-through, and right at the moment when you find out that Adam gets into the car crash, I think everyone's mouths just dropped. 
just kind of looked over at Jordy and I just couldn't get one word out. And I just said, no. It was one of the most saddest moments I've ever had in film. Adam was a fully realized person and lived his true self with confidence. And I think that everyone in high school wishes they could do that. It was amazing to see how many people were able to better describe what they were going through by showing what Adam has gone through under Grassy. It's not an automatic assumption that I know exactly what it feels like to grow up a trans teen in high school. I don't know that. I know exactly what it feels like to grow up a gay boy in high school. When we hired Adamo as an actor, we knew he might be playing a gay character, but we didn't know where that character would go. While Marco premiered in season two, he initially liked Ellie, who was a very close friend of his. What do you do in high school when you're close with somebody of the opposite sex? You date them. Marco and Ellie's relationship was always lovely. He definitely liked her. Ellie was attracted to Marco and wanted to kiss him. And then she asked, do you think I'm Hot. That was the beginning. I think a lot of young gay boys, at least from my experience, always turn into their closest girlfriend to come out to, even when they are their girlfriend. So much had happened in that episode. It was even for someone as uh, dull as Spinner, he was putting it together piece by piece. Spinner's trying to set Marco up with Hazel. And um, sorry, what was your line? Why did you have to get out of that? <laughs> because I had to help my mom make marinara sauce, and I always help her. What's going on? Why did you understand? What, that you're a psycho? You just walked out on a date with one of the grass's coolest girls for your mom's pasta sauce? It doesn't make sense. Yes, it does. Oh, yeah? Then stop crying and explain it to me, because obviously I'm a moron and don't get yeah, it. Because, man. Because why? Because I'm gay. I'd never seen, you know, a teenager coming out on television before. So I was like, wow, this is, this is real. Like, this is, this is pretty heavy. We could see as observers that he had been you know, struggling with ex expressing that side of himself. After all that was said and done, where Marco started and Marco ended, it was like going from inside the closet to out of the closets and then just being in the world, which was a journey that I went on with him. When the Marco storyline came out, a woman wrote in and she said, you know, when my son came out to me, I'm gay. I basically said to him, don't talk to me about it. I don't want to hear about this. And then she saw the Marco storyline. These people will hate you. Uh, nobody hates me. And she reconnected after seven years with her son and said, I'm sorry. I came out to my mom last night. The story of Marco coming out was very dear to my heart. I had a very dear friend. He was a school teacher during the week, and on the weekends, he was a gay man in the bars. And he did not know how to bring the two sides of his life together. I know that Degrassi wanted to tell that story because gay people exist. And gay people exist in high school. And gay people in high school needed help because nobody was talking about it. The fact that Adamo's life and Marco's life so closely tracked each other was amazing. <sighs> the lines are blurred. I keep blurring them. Marco and myself did things so close together. Sometimes he was a step ahead of me and sometimes I was a step ahead of him. A lot of people, you know, say, you know, who was your gay icon growing up? And I have no intention for it to sound self-indulgent, but it really was Marco because I just didn't know any gay people. For me on a personal level, there was this moment, I just had caught eye contact with this boy and he had mouthed to me like, thank you. And I just, in that moment knew like, okay, this kid is gay, like I'm gay. Oh, this is not like just a TV show. This is like an educational platform. Okay, we have about five seconds left, so, so just go, come out go. quickly. I'm gay. I'm gay. <laughs> no, no, no. There's some lines before that, I'm though. Gay. <laughs> Do you want to know who Marco lost his virginity to? <gasps> You're bipolar. You, you've got a chemical imbalance in your brain. You make it sound so easy. Every day is gonna be a struggle. Why, I'm not some loser who tries to hurt himself. It was an accident. I think when it comes to mental illness, it's really hard for people to talk about it. There was still a bit of a stigma about mental health. It was a little bit of a taboo subject. Telling the Ellie Cutting story, it was very important to tell. We really wanted to explore what is it that would make somebody so self-loathing that they would want to self-mutilate in that way. I just didn't even know cutting was a thing. I'd never heard of it at the time. 
but it was happening. I've since known people that have done that. Ellie's cutting and drinking problem. The link between all of those things was that her instinct was to suffer in silence. She didn't see herself as beautiful. She felt she deserved to be in pain. Ellie wasn't perfect, and she wasn't the perfect girl that everyone thought she was. Paige catches her in the bathroom, cutting with the compass. And in that moment, Paige saw someone who was in pain. I don't need help. Then show me your arm. There's nothing wrong with me. Then show me your arm. Yeah, I think that, that really stuck out as like such an iconic moment for both of our characters, these two people from very different worlds, you know, connecting. She was there for her literally when no one else was. It was just a lovely storyline because Paige and Ellie were such enemies. It was to see Ellie show that vulnerability meant she really needed help. We were very worried that people might learn what cutting was and actually want to try it themselves. The last thing we want to do is suggest that negative behavior has a positive outcome. Issues fester and things get worse if you don't talk about them. I know that girls learn cutting yourself doesn't address the issue. Craig, I used to cut myself. And what's bizarre is that I'm always going to be a cutter. Even if I don't do it for years, it's still me. I'm bipolar. Bipolar disorder is chemical imbalance. It's no one's fault, and it's nothing that anyone should be ashamed of. Lots of people don't understand why they have such a temper, why they're so impulsive. What excuses did we make for him trashing that hotel room? We all have bad days. I've been there. We had one take to trash the hotel room. I think I pulled the the, the electrical socket out of the thing so it like sparked and like shocked me. But I kept going. Should I stop? No, I'm gonna keep going and painting and there and TV. And I remember like at the core of my, everyone is like. <laughs> cringing with some of his actions and some of the things he said. Ash and I are getting married. We also were so sympathetic to him. I'm crazy, Ash. You're not crazy. And explain why, despite everything they tell me, I feel fine. He was struggling with a mental illness, but that didn't make him a bad person. That didn't make him a sick person. He was somebody who was really troubled, I remember receiving a lot of mail from teens that were bipolar who loved that there was a character on TV who is healthy and had his ups and had his downs, but was a normal guy and was bipolar and that they were representing it in this realistic way. Nothing is fine, it's all wrong! It was a crazy person, Ice. You were having a manic episode. And hurt a lot of people. When I found out that they were making Eli bipolar, I was very excited. It's about making it authentic and making it real, and I like that. What did you do? I crashed Morty. But you could have died. It was worth it, though. You let her do things, you just, like, why are you doing this? Like, calm down. Woo! Eli and Cam had similar stories and similar backgrounds and similar paths that they walked. And he went one way, and Cam obviously went the other. And, you know, I think it was a perfect bit of irony that Eli was the one that found Cam. We wrote the character of Cam and it would be a short time on Degrassi because we had already planned that this would be our way of exploring suicide. That was like the craziest read through I've ever had when we found out Cam died. I remember that read through so clearly, just being absolutely blindsided. It almost seems obvious looking back that that was gonna happen, but I really didn't know. And like the last scene we had together in the principal's office, it was sort of like my goodbye without saying yeah, goodbye. Yeah, I so remember yeah. that. I actually remember that day when they were like, cut, yeah. and they were like, I know, I couldn't believe it was over. Dylan was incredible with his portrayal of a very talented hockey player and yet a tortured soul. He was a kid trying to navigate the world. He had a little bit more difficulty doing that. He did things that weren't always the best solution of the problem. He wasn't able to cope with them as well as most people. I feel like with Degrassi, everyone usually gets to really low points, but they usually end up okay. So for it to actually happen and him to actually die was like a big thing. Don't look. Just go find a teacher and call 911, okay? It wasn't a fairy tale ending. I think that kind of really woke people up a bit and kind of shook them up. I'm very sorry to have to tell you this, Maya. Campbell Saunders is dead. I just remember standing there 
and watching the fans when Principal Simpson says, Cam Saunders is dead, and watching all these fans just start crying, man. And I was like, wow, man, like that was, that was a powerful scene. When Cam commits suicide, people didn't want to accept it. That's powerful when you've introduced a fictional character that people feel so close for and want to see succeed and lose. The character Maya got a lot of uh, online hate as his girlfriend for not having wept and really reacted as emotionally as all the fans wanted her to react. This is so stupid. It's no one's fault. I mean, it's his fault. We were criticized a lot because we didn't have an incredible eulogy. We didn't want to glorify the act. After one takes their own life, you get to see how everyone else has to deal with it. He was upset. Why didn't you do something? You should have done something! You did nothing! The purpose was to show the devastation for the people that you leave behind and that it was avoidable and it was preventable. Look how intimate we are right now. <laughs> it was uncomfortable. Yeah, we had to like make out. I just grab both of her shoulders and just <laughs> plant such a forceful kiss on her. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs>My favorite relationship was... Oh, Emma and Sean. Drew and Bianca. Paige and Spinner. Jane. This guy right here. Eli and Claire. Eli and Claire. Oh, Eli and Claire. I'll always be here for you no matter what. I love those two. I think the thing that surprised me most about Eli Claire was how well it worked. It's one of those things that just caught fire in a way we didn't expect. How do you begin <laughs> the greatest love story? that Degrassi has ever seen. We had planned for the arc for Eli and Claire early on in season 10. The Eli character is introduced with just the line, you have pretty eyes. That scene was something. It's funny that it had so much weight to it. It turned out so great, but I remember on the day, it was just a whole mess of throwing the glasses in the right spot and then looking the at hers. You. The hearse. The hearse would stop. start. It was so sunny. Yeah. I had to squint my eyes and I was like, he can't even, this line doesn't even make sense because you can't see my eyes because I can't see anything. These pretty eyes. Thanks. These guys are the classic. They're on and off, on and off. Everything is up and down, up and down. And with these two characters, they went through so, so much. Eli. I'm pregnant. It was very interesting to tell that story with Claire because she is one of those characters you would never expect this from. And I think society is so quick to judge pregnant teens. So to tell the story of a teen who is so put together and so ready for her life and honestly a little judgmental of people who make mistakes, for her to make a mistake. Vila and Claire, they needed something to bring them back together. And what I like about that storyline is that after all the drama, they finally found what brought them together in the first place. Claire, we lost the child. There are things we have to deal with. It's okay to take a break. I don't want to take a break! The storyline where they lose the baby, seeing how it's affecting both of us. I just can't believe we're never going to get to know him. We might never know why. It's just not fair. It would have been beautiful and amazing. If you look at those two characters, they're a hurricane of emotion. They're a hurricane of personalities. They're two very bold personalities, opinionated personalities. And so when you have those two huge trains going at each other, sometimes it's a disaster and sometimes it's beautiful. I think my my favorite uh, relationship. Yeah, it's it's that's the hard. Each each of the relationships were 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 great. Paige and Spinner always held like a really special place in my heart. I was very excited to get with Paige. Not the brightest guy in the world, but just this like lovable teddy bear. Oh, Emma and Sean. I mean, Emma and Sean, come on. That's my favorite relationship. She should have married Sean. I don't know how she married Spencer. I don't know how we let that get through. Still think I had the most fun with Jane. Every time we were together, it would just be nonstop laughs and we would have so much fun. They went through cancer the loss of a testicle, a shooting. This is all him, so she, Jane, an incredibly supportive girlfriend, I have to say. Now I'm realizing it, when she was going through things, he couldn't handle not being the center of attention. I think that might be it. But we loved playing. I mean, I loved playing the, the couple. I'm indifferent. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's typical. <laughs> Craig liked the ladies. Every teen show needs a heartthrob. Craig was the heartthrob. There's a reason why all the ladies loved him. When in doubt, kiss Craig, where's to live by? Am I wrong? No, I've, I've... Are you jealous? No, I've done it many times. Oh, okay.
that interview where right. you say my name, you're like, yeah, Aislinn's like hooked up with a lot of people on this yeah. show. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, technically you have. Te te <gasps> no, not like you in person, but I mean like you but character wise. Claire and Drew, I think have a very interesting relationship. Ended up, uh, you know, bumping uglies in the in the storage closet, which kind of leads to a lot more things. And see, I'm insane. I've only kissed two people on the show. I'm just the oh, well Southern Bale. No. Adam had a lot of hot chicks. Um, I mean, Adam was pretty hot, so. <laughs> I saw this meme on Instagram. It was like a picture of my face and said, I can't date you unless Adam's dated you first. And I was like, that is actually so true. If you look back at almost every girl that I've been with. Yeah. It's always nice to see those two characters very vulnerable. We were in a confined space. I think you apologized to Sav, and then we had like a nice little tender moment. But then we broke up like two episodes later. Felicia and Luke's character, Drew and Bianca, like they stayed together for a long, long time. Adam was trying to get with you. Mm-hmm. And you were just too spicy for him. She comes over and plays this flirty act trying to get with me. Right. And uh, I was like, who's this little kitty? Yeah. <laughs> and then after that, we were just hooked. Just hooked mm -hmm. from there on out. And we haven't obviously left that hole, you know, no. right now. <laughs> we're hooked. <laughs> we're hooked, literally. Literally and figuratively. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, honey. Imogen, the best ship name. I love Imogen and Fiona together. I think they were so cute. This guy right here was my first like make out when I was like 14 <laughs> or 15. Like I'd kissed boys, but I never made out with them. So I was really Gosh, nervous. That, that sucks. I feel so bad for you. <laughs> Hip hop is the bunny that Marco got because he had he did not have love in his life. We all know how bunnies replace men. Get ready, hip hop, because you and I are gonna be spending a lot of time together. Weren't you worried for Marco? Like if your close friend got a bunny and said, this is what I need to be no, happy. Oh, it's so cute. I wasn't a fan of hip hop. It's couples therapy, it's what we're shooting. Yep. <laughs> um. <laughs> See, she yeah. always does this. <laughs> exactly, I've had enough of you. <laughs> no, it's too funny. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It was all the really intense stuff that like I liked digging into. The moments where we can joke and, and really laugh, it's just refreshing. Do you remember I had to like put my hand on your hand? And I couldn't and you do it. Stop laughing. I couldn't do it. Because like my hands got hair all over them. <laughs> <laughs>
her on their phone as they take advantage of her. That story was particularly necessary to be told because of the role of technology and social media. Who would do this to me? I thought Anna did just a remarkable job in her acting in that very, very difficult for a young actress to portray someone who is sexually assaulted. I blacked out. I remember being alone with two guys, but I have no idea who they were. These two guys, in their minds, didn't think they did anything wrong, and that's the scariest thing. Too many young boys don't know what appropriate behavior is because they see other people doing it, and they actually are surprised at the idea that it's rape or assault. I was drunk and helpless, and you assaulted me. Well, it's not like you have any proof. I don't need proof to do this. The most challenging day for me on set was filming the dream sequence where Zoe relives her assault. That entire day was just such a mess. Like, you even talk about it, I'm like super emotional. Oh, um, <laughs> it was just so sad. Zoe was kind of indicted as a villain, ah! and we'd seen some of her past behavior we really wanted to talk about how that's irrelevant in that situation. Nobody deserves that kind of treatment. Another part of the story, Becky, whose brother is the one who assaulted Zoe, she has to go through a very complicated journey realizing that her brother has done this terrible thing and that he should pay for it. I think that's an incredibly emotional journey to go through that with Becky. Hey. Stop! You don't need to do this! There's nothing else I can do! There is! I proved it was him! <laughs> A lot of people tagged me on Twitter saying that my storyline really, really helped them. This girl grabbed my arm and she just said, thank you so much. The intensity of that connection was really emotional and really overwhelming. I think that storyline is important to tell, especially on TV to kids that age because it happens a lot and people don't talk about it. Any story which involves assault is important to tell on Degrassi. We showed it, and we've shown it before, and we keep showing it because it sadly keeps happening. I'd personally say the most talked about moment has to be the shooting. Probably, yeah, like universally speaking, to like look at the whole series, it was probably the school shooting. That is the iconic episode of all Degrassi. Is that real? That was huge. I think no show ever did that. You made me do this. Even just the feeling of being on set that day, shooting that episode was different. Degrassi is this thing that connects everyone who's ever worked on it. Even now, like, I miss everyone. I would go back, I'd do it all over again. Better late than never, but never yeah. late is better. <laughs> Drake lyric. <laughs> this is the guy that got Drake shot. I didn't chew him. It was indirect through a chain of events. Wait, I, it, never mind. The most talked about moment is Jimmy getting shot. That was colossal. We had been deeply moved by the Columbine shooting and unfortunately other ones after that. And we actually got in touch with Barbara Coloroso, who wrote the book, um, The Bully, the Bullied, and the Bystander. The most important to Barbara was the bystanders. They're the ones who enable the environment where this kind of activity can go on. And she actually flew up and spent time with us. We had conversations with her and we ran scripts past her. When we found out that there was the shooting, obviously everyone was just curious about who, why, what, where. I remember people coming out from the read-through and Aubrey saying to me, I got shot. The way we approach all of our subject matter, and the school shooting was very much like this, is it has to feel like the story is growing organically and authentically out of the lives of our characters. What was different about the school shooting is that it was this, probably the most intense episode to date, but we were all in it together. We were all involved in this one issue. And everyone sort of had their little moment in that story. Everyone was either sort of a victim or, or an antagonist, and, and you could see how everyone wants to get it right. Rick was a, just a very unfortunate case in Degrassi. Rick 
was in a relationship with Terry. He was in an abusive relationship. He had an accidental outburst. Terry got hurt. He was then shunned by everybody at the school. What are you doing here? Terry's in the hospital and you're just sitting in here? He was the guy that didn't fit in. There is a psycho in our school, Emma. I think Ephraim did a wonderful, wonderful job still giving him some heart and making him human. Afternoon, Emma. Rick is just a perfect example of someone who's been victimized or bullied or just not knowing how to deal and not knowing how to cope. The paint and feathers was just what set him over the top. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. The atmosphere when we shot those scenes was absolutely terrifying. It really was. It was weird to shoot that scene. Rick coming up to Paige in the cafeteria. I thought the whole paint and feathers job was sickening. I think it really just showed how the writers did such a good job of weaving everyone into that. I can't even imagine actually having to have dealt with this in real life. The reason that Rick then uh, decided to go after Jimmy was because of the scene in the bathroom. We made it seem like it was Jimmy that planned this whole thing. Jimmy set the whole thing up perfectly. Spinner had been living with this guilt of indirectly being responsible for his best friend being the, the target of the shooting until eventually he confessed and Spinner lost all his, all his friends. But, I mean, obviously, we were still great friends on set. They didn't hold it against me, what my character had done. It's easy to say that the shooter is evil and everybody else is good, but that's not real life. It really is shades. I was working in the editing room on the scenes where Jimmy actually got shot, and I found them very difficult to work on. I remember that scene just like, I will forever. After he shot Jimmy, he ran into Sean and Emma in the hall. He's got a gun, okay, let's go. Don't turn away from me! Just a gun facing these characters' faces, who you always see as your friends at the same time, was something that still gives me a little bit of a shiver, and I can only imagine what the actors felt on set that day. It felt like the stakes were higher. It just seemed like everyone understood um, how serious what we were tackling was. I remember in that moment thinking, God forbid I should ever really know what this feels like. But at the same time, wow, I'm actually getting to experience one of the most petrifying moments a human could ever face. It's too late. No. It was genuine, the fear. Stop! That was the day that Degrassi grew up. I feel like the, the shooting episode was showing the fans that we weren't pulling any punches. We were going to explore the scary topics that teenagers were nervous about. And hopefully by seeing a story that's so well-crafted like that, it does give people sober second thought if they feel that, you know, they know somebody who might be going down that road or even they themselves might be feeling that way. The interesting thing about these big issues with characters like Cam or JT, Jimmy, you have to love them to actually feel the impact of their loss or injury or what it might be. It can't just be a small supporting character. You have to let a main character that you've grown to love be affected. And that's the only way that that weight of violence is gonna really make an impact. And that's what I felt. It's like, Jimmy can't get shot, and he was. There is something about that teenage experience where things Things seem to happen in really sharp, vivid colors. Degrassi's just like constantly been at the forefront of every new issue that faces teens today. A lot of the stuff that happens on the show are things that teenagers don't always feel they have a platform to talk about. Is this relevant? You know, do you have friends who have gone through similar situations? The big mandate of Degrassi is to reassure young people that they are not alone. That someone is listening and that they are empowered. We love the show, we love storytelling, but we really do hope that we're making a difference in the lives of these young people. This show was so life-changing for me because of the family that I got from it. You're sharing your life together. And for a lot of these guys, you're growing up together. I talk about it all the time. It was one of the best experiences of my, of my life. It was like, Oh, so cool. Yeah. They say you've got to be dark just to get through the night. They could block out the sun.
but I still have your light. Degrassi sort of set the bar way too high. I don't know if I'll ever do anything better than Degrassi. It is really one of the greatest acting institutes. It's definitely been my favorite acting moment, and I'm sure it will be, like, no matter what comes along. I'm not giving just so amazing. Our cast was a really big family and we were all there for each other and we just had the most amazing time on set working together. And they're really an incredible group to have worked with over the years. Virtually all of them are just the most solid human beings you can imagine. Bonding with the cast was incredible. We just had so much fun shooting together. I think it's something that <laughs> you carry with you for the rest of your life. I'm not giving it was more than a cast, and it was more than work colleagues. They were my friends and my family, and now they make up the majority of my friend group. I mean, I just lived with Annie and Chloe in LA, and I'm gonna continue to keep those people in my life. You leave um, with a connection. It's a shared experience that only a few lucky people get to have. There's a weird bonding element to being on Degrassi that no matter how long it's been, they're always gonna feel like family, and that's an amazing thing. I felt like I finally found my people. Yeah.